All right, we've been going through John chapter 7, uh, where we were last week. So we'll do a very quick review and then we'll move right into John chapter 8. Uh, John is making um, copies of the, the questions. All right, and in John chapter 7, um, this is Jesus teaching at the feast and some of the things that uh, he was talking about um, was that... Um, well, let me just ask. John, I need one of those. So he gets into the, uh, the midst of the feast and he goes up to the temple. Uh, we talked very briefly about his brothers. Who it says that they didn't believe him, but they wanted him to, to go up and, and make this big spectacle of himself. It, he says it's not his time and he was not going to go. So by the time we get to verse uh, 14, uh, it was the midst of the feast. Jesus goes up to the temple and he begins to teach. What were some of the things that he teaches? Verse 17 is where I want to kind of focus in on. Well, the doctrine is not mine. Right. Yeah, it's not my, my teaching. It's God's teaching. Right. And he goes on to say, if anyone's willing to do his will, and that is God's will, he'll know that the teaching, whether or not I'm teaching you, is the truth or not. And, um, and then he goes on to talk about Moses and the law and that they are seeking to kill him. And, you know, the crowd answered, you have a demon. Who, who's wanting to kill you? And um, so we see this whole discussion happening, and um, we also see that they were seeking to kill him. And in verse 25, you know, we, we saw that they asked the question, well, who's seeking to kill you? Verse 25, so some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, is this not the man whom they're seeking to kill? So we see this, a lot of confusion kind of going on. And the more Jesus talks, the more confusion there is. Or I should say the more disagreement there is. Because he is kind of cutting through a lot of the confusion and laying out what the truth is. Now, whether or not they they choose to believe it is completely on them. Um, we do see in verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to seize him. They go out there, they listen to some of the uh, some of the teachings, and they come back without Jesus. And what's the question? I'm verse 45, 46, 47. Why didn't you get him? Yeah, where is he? Why didn't you get him? And their answer is, never has a man spoke like this. In verse 47, uh, their answer to that is, you have not also been led astray, have you? And so... Then, what becomes their standard of what one ought to believe? And in verse 48, not one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? So we're the standard. The standard was the Pharisees. Yeah, it, what we believe is the standard. And yet, their evidence is never has a man spoken like this. And we continue, and I want to continue to point this out also, because I believe it's important that we continue to point this out, and that is... People are responding to the message that he has. The words that he's speaking. Remember the Samaritans and how they kind of came around. You know, we, we believe because of what the woman of the well said. We believe that. But now we believe because of what he says. No miracles required. And yet we see all of these signs and all of these wonders being done. These attesting miracles being done. And yet people still will not believe. So if they're not believing those things, they're certainly not going to believe His words. And here we see that's uh, exactly what's being stated is no one of the rulers of Pharisees believed Him, has He? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. Well, whose job was it to teach the law? It was their job. And they're saying we're not very good at our job is really what they admit here. But, you know, you can see the frustration that they're having with the popularity of the message that's coming from Jesus. And then we see in verse 50, finally, Nicodemus steps in. And we know who this Nicodemus is. He's the one that came to him at night. He steps in and says, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he's doing, does it? 
And they said, well, no, wait a minute. You're not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. We pointed to Isaiah. We showed where there is a scripture that actually says that. However, again, we see that there is some reasoning that's happening. And I, and I don't think that Nicodemus is the only one. There is some reasoning kind of happening with some of the Pharisees. And um, he's the one we know about because John's talking about him. But you see that there's some conflict that's even happening even inside of the Pharisees themselves. And then in verse 53 it ends up, and everyone went to his home. Well, what we see in chapter 8 is but. So, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. So, it's a continuation of of this discussion that was just being discussed between the Pharisees of Jesus, it's a complete thought that John is having here. It doesn't start anything new. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning He came into, again into the temple. So where was He teaching in uh, John 7? It says He was in the, in the midst of the feast. He went to the temple. So He goes again into the temple and all the people were coming to Him and He sat down and began to do what? Teach. Teach. That's what he does. Again, we kind of have this mindset that he just goes around doing all of these miracles and that's what people are believing. What we're seeing in John is that yes, there were miracles that happened, but they were only there to confirm what he was actually teaching was truth. And so he begins to teach them. Now, being shamed the way that they were before and the frustration that the scribes and the Pharisees have had with him, we see this being placed here for us to kind of see what's going on. And this is the story that most of you guys will, will or most, uh, most people will know as the adulterous woman. She is brought before Jesus, and there's a reason that she was brought before Jesus. And in uh, my first question is, why did the religious leaders bring this woman to Jesus? We see that um, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman. She was caught in adultery. Um, and they sit her in the center of the court. So basically where that temple was. Um, and they said to him, Teacher, because he's teaching, this woman has been caught in adultery, in adultery in the very act. What does the law of Moses say? Now remember what the discussion was in John chapter 7 and the um, challenge that was kind of put out there in John chapter 7 and verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law and yet none of you carries out the law? Now I want you to remember that because that's what we're about to see here. And there's very few times that I will get up here and, and teach what it does not say. <clears throat> because I believe it's important that we understand what it says and then everything else you kind of know is not representative of what's being stated. But because of the uh, misconception of what's going on here in John chapter 8, it is important that we do talk about what it does not say. But let's just kind of read through it. Now the law, now in the law, verse 5, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, who is, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone. And the woman, when she was there, where she was, in the center of the court, straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Where are they? And he said, Did no one condemn you? She said, No, Lord, no one. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. <clears throat> now, let me tell you what it does not say. It does not say that if you've had sin in your life, that you cannot call sin, sin. And that's what's placed in here a lot of times. Is whenever you're calling sin, sin, they'll say, well, are you the first one to cast the first stone? Don't you have sin in your life? Well, what they state here is actually correct. And that is, 
the law of Moses commanded them to do what with someone caught in the act of adultery? Mike actually says that both parties have to be put to death and they only brought the woman there. So they're, they are a little off here because the man's not present. Correct. But they were to stone them. Now, no, but they were to put them to death. It didn't necessarily say stone. They were to be killed. The stoning was how the Jews did it. But they were to put to death. Well, actually, it says in um, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 7, that the hand of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all people, so you shall purge the evil from your midst. And then it goes on um, to, to your point in verse 6, on the evidence of two or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. So you had to have at least two witnesses, and those witnesses were the first one to put their hand on him to kill him. Now, and that's what Jesus is alluding to here. Now, why would God tell them that these people are the ones who are supposed to carry out this death uh, sentence to them? Uh, it, and if you back up to verse 5, it does say you need to stone them. Um, and I mean, that's in Deuteronomy 17, verses, verses 5 through. Um, but why does it say that you have to, that this is a death sentence, but no one can carry it out. Because everyone's got sin. So that's not what he's stating here. I mean, they, they were told by God to carry this out, and he goes on to talk about it so that you can purge the evil from your midst. But if he's saying that you can have no sin to do it, then all of them had sin, and so therefore no one could even carry out the command of God, and that is to purge the evil from the from their midst. So we know that's not what's being stated here. That is a very popular misconception, though, of what's going on here. There's another uh, popular misconception or a twisting of the scriptures. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is, Jesus is saying, if you've never done anything that according to the law of Moses would require death, your death, then you go ahead and cast the first stone. That again cannot be because what you're saying is every one of these Pharisees that had come here has done something that would have caused them to be stoned according to the law of Moses. Now, Let's look at, let's back up and look at Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 17, as we, as we uh, have kind of alluded to, and look at what Jesus is talking about here. In verse 5, Then you shall bring out that man or that woman who has done this evil uh, deed in your gates, that is, the man or the woman, and you shall stone them to death, on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall be put to death on the he shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. The hand of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all people. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. So what he is saying is this: since you're the witness, go ahead and cast the first stone. Mike, what sin is they, are they talking about? There's somebody missing. There's what? There's someone missing. Are they talking about forbidden forms of worship or are they talking about adultery? Here, they're talking about forbidden forms of worship. So they're not talking about adultery. They're not talking about adultery specifically in Deuteronomy. So they're not talking about stoning an adultery. They're talking about stoning somebody. Correct. Else. But whenever one was supposed to be put to death, this is how it was done. It's the only one I find. Well, it's the only one I know of. So, my point is this. If you're a witness to that, it says that both everyone who is involved in that needs to be brought forth. The man is missing, just as you pointed out, John. And so, if the man is missing... Who witnessed this? 
Well, presumably they did not. But they, they know the woman was caught in adultery, so they're violating God's law. Right. Mm -hmm. One, because they probably didn't witness it. Two, the man's not there, and their Christ reads the evil intent of their heart. They're misrepresenting the situation and God's law. Correct. And what did he say in John chapter 7 about the law of Moses and them? They don't even carry it out the way it's supposed to be carried out. If you do not carry out the law of God, or you're against the law of God, what, what's it called? It's called sin. And so when he makes that statement that they, well, they said this test in him, but when they persisted, he said, straightened up and he said, he was without sin. In other words, if you follow the law of Moses the way it should be, then you're without sin according to this. You're without sin among you. Let him be the first to throw the first stone. Well, I think there's, I think you, there's a disconnect there between it was done for spectacle. It was done to get Jesus to, to say something so they could get it. And on top of that, like you said, they didn't have a witness. And, you know, Jesus told her, He said, don't, He said, come and sin no more. So you're starting to see where, you know, again, where He's, you know, He's talking about change your heart. You know? Yeah. Um, and we'll get to that. Because Jesus deals with a couple of different things here. First of all, with the Pharisees and the scribes that brought her, and then he deals with her as well. And right now, I want to kind of talk about what he's talking about specifically here, what their sin is. And like I don't even know if they would have had the authority to have done that under a Roman government. They wouldn't have. Out, you know? So it was another one of their, you know, this raised all the fuss there. And yeah. And Go ahead, and then I'll get to you. Yeah, there is actually another charge a little bit further back in Deuteronomy 22.20 that does not require the man to be executed. That's if he finds her not to be. We don't know in the story. The story does not tell us which one. But this one in 22, death was punishment by stoning. Um, in which case, the Pharisees are trying to trick him into either committing murder under Roman law or violating the law of Moses. And she turns it back on her heads. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 22, it says, If a man is found lying with a married woman, then both of them shall die. The man who lays with the married woman and the woman, you shall purge the evil from Israel. So that... I'm sorry, 21, I'm sorry. Yeah, and so whenever I see that kind of language of purging the evil from Israel, purging the evil out of the land, it kind of tells me what kind of death we're talking about. And the only consistency that I can kind of find is that purge it out of your land. Either way, the man is supposed to be brought there also. Verse 21. I'm sorry, I had one person. Okay. Yeah, again, you know, Israel, by playing the harlot in her father's house, you shall purge the evil from you. But her, she is committing adultery, so it seems as if she is married Right, but that's what right. first, that's what it is. Right. And starting with verse thirteen, is the husband goes find out she's not a virgin, they can take some charges for adultery and she gets down. Right. The only time that only one party was going to be put to death was if um if she was out in the field somewhere and somebody raped her and she screamed. Yeah. Because if she didn't scream, then they both got killed. Right. They were both put to death. But if she screamed, she was so it's nothing she could do. Yeah. You know? The, of course, there's all kinds of ideas about what's behind the scenes that's not fully revealed. Uh, he, when he asks them, he who's without sin casts the first stone, he's saying he's without sin in this matter. Right. He's not saying who's sinless here. So they have in one way or another, either not bringing the man or being involved in setting this up as a case to take to Jesus, like the day before, they're mad at him, well, let's figure out how to do this. Maybe they've known about it before, maybe they didn't, maybe they set this woman up and they brought her, maybe one of the men among them was actually the man who committed adultery, that's how they knew about it to start with. We don't know all those details, but somehow, these men are complicit in, in sin in this case. And when they come to him and they're trying to throw the law at 
occupy space. He's like, okay, let's follow the law. Right. Well, you're guilty per the law. This this isn't Jesus just <laughs> ignoring the law. He's observing it and he's saying, okay, let's take first things first. You're guilty. Yeah, and you know, and again, if you back up to John seven, that's the exact thing that he said they are guilty of. And why they won't believe him and who he is. And this is just evidence of that. And so, you know, he kind of cuts through their smoke and mirrors and all this kind of stuff. We again, we don't know the background of this. I've all I've also heard it said that she had been caught a long time ago. However, because of Roman rules, she couldn't be stoned. So they kind of brought her just, you know, even though it would have been done in the past and it should have been, it should have been carried out immediately. And so, you know, I've, I've heard that also. I, you know, I don't know. All I know is they brought her for a very specific purpose and it certainly wasn't so that they could purge the evil out of their, out of their midst. It was so they could test Jesus to trip him, to trick him up, as, as you pointed out. Go ahead. And just one other thing, when they come to him and they challenge him with this, initially, he ignores them. Yeah. He, he doesn't get onto their agenda. And that's a great lesson for us. People will come to us and challenge, you know, here's a very important religious, urgent matter that we need to address. And we don't have to address it. We, we perceive it's a trap or it's it's going to cause an issue. Okay, this is a setup here. This is a problem. No matter the answer I give, it's it's going to be used against truth. Then we have a right to say, no, I'm, yeah. I'm not answering your question. Yeah, and you know, and I and I have also, and I was going to point this out, was that I have heard whole sermons in denominational world about what he was writing on the ground. <laughs> I have no idea. I just know it showed a great disinterest in what they were into. That he just starts, whatever. Yeah, if God would have revealed it if we needed help. Exactly, exactly. But, you know, the, the main thing here is, again, it is set up as a trap for Jesus. He doesn't fall into it. Instead, he reveals their hypocrisy through saying, okay, you want to talk about the law? Well then, let's talk about the law. If you're without sin, again, as you pointed out, in this matter, and that is you're following the law the way it's supposed to be doing, you're supposed, you have the right motive, and that is you're trying to purge the evil out of your midst. If you have the right, um, the right witnesses, you can't have just one, you've got to have at least two. And you've got the right people, which you only have half the people here. So you go ahead, pick up the stone and, and cast at her. And so, whenever he says this, um, in verse 7, they persisted, and that's whenever he makes this statement. Again, he shows disinterest in them. He again stoops down and starts to ride on the ground. Exactly what he was doing before. And then it says, when they heard it, do you think that did something to them? Now, the interesting thing here is they actually had stones in their hands. <clears throat> it, I guess, I, you know. One, one thing it shows is they were not completely beyond the reach of being convicted of, of, of God's Word actually working on them. They, right. they had enough sense about them. They're like, oh, he just completely destroyed us here. And of course, they have a big crowd around them. Everybody's watching this. Everybody's listening to this. And evidently, people observing this could see, ah, he's, he's got them. They're yeah. wrong. Yeah. And I heard some whispering over here. Where are the stones? They brought her to be stoned, and it doesn't mention that they even had any. And the first ones who were supposed to start it is the witnesses. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, 
and then with the younger ones. And then he was left alone, just him and the woman in the center of the court. And after that, now he's dealt with them. Now he's going to deal with her. Does he say that she is A-OK? -okay? Absolutely not. Straighten up, Jesus says to her, woman, where do you, you know, where are they that were accusing you? Did anyone condemn you? And she says, no. And Jesus says, I do not condemn you either. Why does he say that? He 100% respected the law of Moses. Correct. And he had no right under that law right. to legally do anything. Correct. He was not a witness to it. This was just them kind of bringing someone saying this, but yet we don't really have any conviction behind what they said. Um, so, but, you know, that's what he's saying is, I, I don't have the right to condemn you either. But he does say this, from now on, go and sin no more. So is he saying you've done nothing wrong here? She got out of this situation by the skin of her teeth. And so Jesus is telling her exactly what he has been teaching in John chapter 7 and verse 17. If anyone is willing to do his will, and that is to not sin, he will know of the teaching whether it is God or whether I speak of, from myself. They were unwilling to follow the law. And he's saying she's unwilling also, and he's given her this very stern warning, go and sin no more. Because the next time, they'll be a little bit more prepared, I guess. Or maybe the right motive, you know, or what have you. I think so, it was, I think it was so she would not have sin in her life. I mean, that was, he was telling her that, you know, because she needs to think about God. Not because of them, not because of the fear of them, because because she has a someone else much much higher than she has. An Very good point. Very good point. You he know, he's taking it into the spiritual level. Yeah, he's taking her to a higher level. Don't be afraid of them. Be afraid of the Father and the sin that you're committing. Even if you get away with it, you're still not getting away with it. It's a good point. Anything else? Mike, also here we have an example of unrighteous judgment. These men were using somebody's sin to further their own cause, possibly to humiliate or embarrass someone, and also to, to get somebody, Jesus, into a corner. Those are all examples of unrighteous judgment, and we should never, ever do something like that. The reason that we expose sin is to bring somebody to the mercy and the grace of God and to get, to get them to change their ways. And that's what Christ did here. We have an advocate, which is Christ. Well, this woman had, had an advocate too, and it was Christ who was con convincing her to change her ways, move away from her sin, and, and move towards God. That's the reason that we expose sin, not to humiliate, not to embarrass, and never to further our own, our own agenda. And that goes to Stephen's point on why we would ever get involved in a, in a conversation about something like this. If it's not to change somebody, to bring them to the mercy of God, then we leave it alone and don't, don't get into the discussion. Yes. Um, you know, and I, and I kind of uh, noted uh, in, my, in my notes uh, Ezekiel chapter 18. I believe this is kind of what Jesus was going for, and that is in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 21. But if the wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed and observes all my statutes and practices judges, uh, justice and righteousness, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All of his transgressions which he has committed will not be remembered against him because of his righteousness which he has practiced, he will live. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather than he, that he should turn from his ways and live? And that's exactly what's being played out here. Christ had no interest whatsoever in putting this wicked woman to death. He was more interested in bringing her to righteousness. As you pointed out, you know, Joe, and I think that's a very good point of what's being stated here to her, go and sin no more. Fall into Ezekiel chapter 18. Be that person. And um, I also uh, wanted to take note of um, 
Matthew chapter 7, and I think that John alluded to this, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, and it talks about, you know, being um, a judge with a righteous judgment. These men certainly were not judging with a righteous judgment, but it says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the way that you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye, out of your eye, and behold, a log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take out the log, of, log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give uh, what is holy to the dogs, and we'll stop there. But, you know, a clear example of them casting judgment, and with that judgment, would they like that kind of judgment upon them? And that is, they sin in order to expose your sin. That is a clear violation of, or a clear example of having a log in your eye trying to take the speck out of someone else's eye. You are a teacher of the law. The scribes and the Pharisees were the leaders of the law. And they were breaking the law left and right in order to condemn this woman. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, all that kind of goes hand in hand in some of that teaching. And um, now again, all that being stated, the question that's being asked to them is not if you have any kind of sin in your life. We have to expose sin and we have to expose our own sin first and foremost. We have to, you know, be readily um, acceptable that we do have sin and whenever you start to admit that, then we can start fixing that sin because the only way to fix it is to admit that it's there. And so we have to admit the sin that is in our own lives, continue to work uh, those things out and be this woman and understanding what Jesus says, go and sin no more. Whatever, whatever that is. Alright, so question number three was what did Jesus say to the woman? We know he said, what can we learn about Jesus from this? And I think that we've kind of uh, talked about that, that he's more interested in bringing people to the Father, bringing people to believe in whom he is, bringing people to, um, to, um, to righteousness rather than letting them slip away into eternity in their own sin. Luke chapter 9 Luke 9 56 no, 56 for the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives but to save them correct so that is the point behind all of this is he didn't come to destroy these people he came to save them. to point the way to be saved and we're going to see more on that because he's fixing to say something that is very profound in verse 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. They're really kind of squabbling with him now. And then Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going, but you do not know where I came from, and you do not know where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. We just saw that. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. Even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. How is the Father testifying about him? <clears throat> Jesus goes into a long explanation on this back in chapter 5 where he gives, gives, gives detail on this. Mm -hmm. He's not going to go over with him again. But, you know, the miracles and... You know, everything that uh, the scriptures, the prophecies testified about. You know, he was with John in baptism. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Evidence is everywhere of this, that the Father is behind this. And um, so they said to him uh, in, verse, in verse 18, 
I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. In verse 19, notice their question. So they were saying to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. In other words, if you were to listen to the words that I'm talking, and you were to believe them, you would know who my Father is. That wouldn't even be a question that you would even have. Look at all the evidence around you that we continue to point out, the miracles, the signs, the attesting uh, wonders that we have, the uh, prophecies that He has met, all of these things, everything that He says, everything that He does shows that the Father is with Him. And then it says, so they were saying to Him, where is your Father? Jesus answered, you, know, you don't know Me, so therefore you don't know My Father. In verse 20, these words He spoke in the treasury as He taught in the temple, and no one seized Him because His hour had not yet come. Now, He doesn't stop there. Because now the pressure is kind of on them to at least give some kind of answer. So He doesn't stop there. And he uh, said again to them, I go away, you'll seek me, and, I'll, and you will die in your sins. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So they're saying, where's the only place that a person can go that we can't go? Well, he's going to kill himself. And surely he's not going to do that. Where am I going that you cannot come? And he was saying to them, you are from below. And that is, you think on this, on this sphere of earth. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. We're two completely different entities here. Therefore I said to you, you'll die in your sins. And unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Now, verse 24 is a profound statement that He actually makes that they start asking a little bit about and it turns into a whole other thing. Most authorities on the scriptures that, that I can read, you know, and a lot of uh, commentaries also, will point back to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, where God tells Moses, You tell them, I am has sent you. And we start seeing that be played out even more here. Whenever he says, I am he, you will die in your sins. If you don't believe, I am he. So they were saying, Who are you? Jesus said to them, what I've been saying to you from the beginning. Just a quick Go point. In, in the New King James Version, it has the italics for other wow. words. And the word he is in the word. Wow. It's, so it's added in there. I, I am. Yeah. Yeah, mine has got that also. A little footnote there also. Um, and then it says in verse 27, they did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So, we see this in verse 28. We see this one more time. And we've seen this already in John chapter 3. So Jesus said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know I am He. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And so, what He just says there is, You are going to do what to me? Yeah, you're going to be crucifying me. And whenever you see me on that cross, whenever you see me lifted up, that you're going to be doing, you'll know what we're talking about here. But did they? And yet still, even after that point, they still would not accept who He was. He even tells them right here a future event that they are going to be involved in. Verse 29, and he who sent me is with me, he who has not left me alone, for I will always do the things that are pleasing to him. And as he spoke these things, many believed in him. So this crowd obviously is listening and they are very receptive to what he's saying. They believe the testimony that He's giving. They believe the testimony of the Father also of these signs, these wonders, these miracles. And then it says, Jesus says to those who had believed Him, if you continue in My Word, then you are truly disciples of Mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, we quote that a lot, and that is, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But there's a contingency upon that. What's the contingency? 
if you continue in the Word, if you continue in the Word, then you're truly disciples. That's what a disciple does. He continues in the Word. He doesn't back out of it. And that's how you're set free. They answered him, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Notice who he was talking to. Go ahead. Yeah, he's, he's talking. It just said they believed in him. Yeah. It, and it tells us there is, in this case, it's drawing a distinction between somebody who believes and somebody who's a disciple. Yeah. Now, the disciple is always a believer, but a believer is not always a disciple. <laughs> yeah, very good point. And you look into the world around us, there's a lot of people who believe Jesus is Lord and Savior, but they are not His disciples. Right. And He says, continue in my word. Well, He gives this word. Now they're questioning the word. Well, now wait a minute. We're Abraham. We've never been enslaved. So He has to, he has to break it down for them so they understand. Now, Verse 34, Jesus answers them and said, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. So what is he saying I am going to make you free of? Sin. 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 You know, you can break that yoke that you have. Go ahead. I just wanted to, how did they get that they were never in bondage to you? Since they were I have no idea. I thought that also. <laughs> No. I, you know, I guess that they're thinking under Roman rule. I mean, they've been on all kinds of, they've been pawns in all kinds of games and stuff like that. I don't, I never really understood that either. They're just very proud, you know, I guess. And well, I think they're they're thinking about their lineage that they are from Abraham's lineage, and as a result, they're automatically going to go to heaven. They they see that part of it. They're not they're not talking about, you know. Uh, their, their physical freedom. They're thinking about their lineage and their their, their eternal home. And Christ is saying, if you're in, if you're still in your sin, then you're a slave of Satan, and his chains are around you, and you are you are not free. They can't they can't see that. Right. They're they're thinking on a physical level. He's talking about a well, spiritual thing. They're thinking about their physical lineage, but the, they're thinking about heaven. You right. Know, not not that they've never been. Under that heaven. physical lineage is going to translate to something spiritual, right. and Jesus is saying it doesn't. You know, you're, you're a slave to sin. And then he goes on to say, So if the Son of Man makes you free, you'll be free indeed. I know you're Abraham's descendants. Yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak these things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. Now he describes their father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said, If you are Abraham's children, then do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me. Now that's certainly not something that Abraham would do. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. So Abraham understood truth whenever he heard it. He understood that truth comes from God. And that he's challenging them, if you're truly Abraham's seed, then do be what Abraham is. You are doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one Father, God. A couple of things went on here. Go ahead. You see this progression in their mind of, okay, we've never been admonished. Wait, wait a second, wait a second. Well, Abraham is our Father. What, you know, and then, wait, wait, God. God is our Father. It, it's, it's like they're, they're struggling to play catch up with where He is and telling them, you, you got a problem here. Here's your father. He doesn't let them get off that point. He right. keeps bringing it back. No, oh, I'm telling you about your father. Your yep. father. Your father. And he and he tells them point blank here in just a second who their father actually is. Go ahead. I'm curious as to this part here, because at the beginning of this segment, he says he's talking to the Jews that believe in him. Now we've obviously got a fairly big crowd here. I'm curious if the people talking back to him because he. It, it says that, but then it says, he says to them back, you're trying to kill me. So I wonder just how many people in this crowd who knows that ain't listening versus the ones that are. And the ones that are about to take this whole situation south pretty quickly. Well, obviously the ones that are chastening, <laughs> you know, for lack of a better term, that are kind of going, uh, going back and forth with him, obviously are the ones that he's trying to get to where the others are. 
if that makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, trying to get them to understand, you know, where they need to be. But he basically says this um, in verse uh, 40, uh, 42, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I have not even come of my own initiative, but he who sent me. And then he says this, why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. Now what he is saying here is that everything he has spoken has come from God. It has a very distinct ring to it, a very distinct sound to it, because it's truth. Yet they do not understand it. So what does that mean? What language do they understand? In verse 44 he says, You are your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. Just like I do the desires of mine, you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. He just talked about them wanting to kill him. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. He is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. You, you can't comprehend it. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? Now, there, that was some very heavy questions. And I know we're running out of time and we're kind of having to speed through this. But those two questions right there, which one of you convicts me of sin? What have I done that's wrong? And if I haven't done anything wrong and I haven't spoken anything except the truth, why are you not believing me? Well, the only thing is that I can come up with is that you are doing the desires of your father and that is of the devil. So, we have to kind of see ourselves in that also whenever we don't want to do what God tells us. And we want to be wrapped up in sin and make excuses for it, whatever it is. We have to see ourselves in this. In verse 47, he who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them because you're not of God. Now, you just said that God was your Father. However, you're not doing His Word. You're not doing His will. You're not listening to what He has to say. I'm telling you. And Mike, this is a case where they really did believe they were of God and following God right. and honoring God. And he's, he's bringing out to them your self-deceit. Correct. And there's a lot of people like that in today's world also. Very self-deceived and thinking I'm in God's camp whenever they're actually not. And they're fulfilling the role of their father, and that is they're living a lie. And it's not that they were actively worshiping Satan, but they were following their own will, which is the same as someone who, is, who would be a, you know, what we call a Satanist today. If we give ourselves over to our own passions, our own desires, our own wants and wishes, well, then we're, we're, we're Satan's slave and slaves, and he has his chains around us because we're not, we're not uh, putting God first in our lives and following his will. Correct. We cannot do what we want. Right. Exactly. Very good point. All right. Let's sprint to the end. All right. The Jews answered him and said, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? <laughs> so I guess that's their argument now. Jesus said, I do not have a demon. But I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Truly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and the prophets also, and you say, if anyone keeps your word, he'll never see death. Surely you're not greater than our father Abraham, who died, the prophets died too. Who do you make yourself out to be? And so their argument is this. You just told us that we can live forever if we believe you, yet Abraham died. You're saying you're better than Abraham. The prophets died. You're saying you're better than them. So who are you making yourself out to be? Listen to this exchange. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God, the one that you call God. And you have not come to know Him, but I know Him. And if I say that I do not know Him, I will be a liar like you. But I do, not know, but I do know Him, and I keep His word. That's the difference between you and I. 
Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. What's he saying to him here? Abraham saw something in the future. He rejoiced to see my day. And then notice what they say. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 old, 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? His answer, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And then, back to the woman, they found some stones. They picked up stones to throw at him. And I don't think that they were mad at him because he said, I'm really old. It was because he declared something that they thought was worthy of death. So what did he just say? I'm God. I am. I am God. I am God. So Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. And what... This shows us, of course, the true nature of Christ, but we connect it back to Exodus chapter 3. When we read that, we generally think solely of God the Father. Right. But it was Jehovah God speaking to Moses there, and the nature of God is shared by three beings, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are all of that same deity of, they could all rightfully say, I am. Oh, I, yeah, right, correct. It, it's just simply a declaration of self-existent. Right. We, we, no beginning, no end, no dependence on anything else. We exist because we are of this nature. And when he declares that, they knew exactly what he was saying. You know, these other things, through here, they act like we don't understand. We don't, you know, what, what do you say? What do you say? This shows us right here. Oh, they got it. Yeah. They, they were just stubborn the whole way, not willing to receive it. They actually received what he just said, but didn't like it. Right. At all. And I will tell you this also in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, it says exactly that. Right. And it's important to note why they wanted to stone him because he said, I am God. Because when you turn to John chapter 1 in their Bible, it's completely different. But this is exactly the same. So he says something that sparked them to say he, needs, he deserves death. And he declared himself to be God right there. Anything else? I know we're way out of time. I appreciate your patience with me. We got started a little late. But uh, there's a lot in John chapter 8. And... Um, if you'll notice in John chapter 9, or let's start in verse 59, therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. That's how John 9 starts. So the thought continues. This is all kind of happening all at once. So there's a lot going on in Jerusalem right now. All right, I'd like for you to think about those things uh, for next week, and I will get uh, the questions out to you guys.